Hello everyone. Oh yeah, that's definitely working. Hello. My name's James. I'm the pastor at Salisbury Baptist uh, and I'm going to lead us in prayer. Uh, Lord, we've just heard precious words from Jesus our Saviour. And he prayed that you would make us holy by the truth and that we might love one another. We pray that's exactly what might happen. And that you would be glorified in our time together, uh, as you have been already. Enable me to speak the truth and us all to hear it and to live by it and be made holy and pleasing in your sight and ready to love. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks for um, inviting me to speak tonight. I'm not quite sure how I was chosen. Um, perhaps someone drew lots when I wasn't there. I'm not sure. Uh, but I can at least tell you how I chose the passage that we're uh, looking at tonight. As I was pondering what to choose, I was led quite quickly to John 17. We're in the Easter season, and so something with a kind of Eastery flavor seemed appropriate. Uh, and the theme tonight is unity. So what better passage than this wonderful prayer of Jesus on the night before he died as he prays for himself and his disciples and those who follow on afterwards and as he prays for unity. And as I was preparing, I was re really puzzled by verse 22. Find out if this one's working. Yes. There. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I have given them glory so they might be one. How does that work? What does it mean for Jesus to give us his glory, and how does that make us united? Uh, and so this sermon is basically an exploration of the week I've spent trying to figure out what that means. Uh, I'm going to answer my big question, how does Jesus giving us glory unite us, by breaking it down into four questions, which will structure this sermon. What is Jesus' glory? How does Jesus give it to his people? What's the result? And what does that look like in practice? The big question is the first one, though. What is Jesus' glory? So we'll start there. Glory is a key word in John's gospel. He uses it in a particular way, which is going to help us. God's glory generally, though, means a manifestation of God present and acting, an appearance, a moment, a breakthrough of God present and acting. And Throughout the Bible, that always comes with a sense of awe, of majesty. People get a sense that God is there. You think back to Moses' time, they saw God's glory when a cloud came and covered the tent of meeting where the people would meet with God. Or when they saw God act, like when he sent the plagues on Egypt and parted the sea, we've sung about God making a way, they said, look, it's the glory of God has been revealed to us. God's glory, a manifestation of God present and acting. And Jesus, as the divine Son of God, also has this glory, right? Because he's God. But it's mostly hidden as he walks the earth, because he's also taken on human flesh. So start of the chapter, nearly verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This verse tells a little story, actually. It says that Jesus used to have glory, and now he doesn't, but he's ready to get it back again. Before he became incarnate, Jesus shared the honor and majesty of God. He lived with his Father in unapproachable light. The angels bowed down to him constantly. 
He was truly glorious. But Jesus gave that up temporarily, didn't he, to come and live amongst us? There were not angels around Jesus all the time, bowing down that everyone could see that he was the Son of God. It was hidden. And I think that's helpful because when Jesus says, I gave my glory to the disciples, he's not talking about this kind of, I am obviously God glory, because the disciples are also not surrounded by angels bowing down to them and worshipping them. How could that be? They are just people. So what does it mean for Jesus to say, I've given them glory? He can't mean that glory. Or at least not exactly. As you read through John's Gospel, there are, there are moments when Jesus' glory shines through. When it's revealed to the people present, they glimpse the majesty and the honor of God that rests upon Jesus in some way. Because what he says and what he does is a total expression of the Father's will. And that means that God's work is constantly being manifested, worked out, appearing in Jesus. God's glory keeps on being revealed by what Jesus says and what he does. If you have brought a Bible along, um, you can flip over to John chapter 2, or you can just read it on the screen. Um, Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding. Famous story. John tells the story, and at the end he says, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. John says that as Jesus went about his ministry, he started to reveal his glory by the signs he did, the miracles that he did. Every time he does something supernatural, he lets people glimpse the glory of God, something of the Father's work in the world. You can see another example of that in John 11.4, which we happen to preach at Salisbury this morning. Um, and as this glory is being revealed, then the disciples start to get it. They understand. They realize. They see. And they begin to believe. They begin to believe in Jesus, that he has been sent from the Father, that he has the authority from the Father, that he speaks the words of the Father. That is, he has the glory of God, God's work and God's words in him. You following so far? Jesus gives up kind of the obvious glory that he's always had to come to earth, and yet, even on earth, because he's always doing the will of God, something of the glory of God rests upon him. There's a twist, though, in John, because Jesus doesn't only talk about miracles as the way he displays God's glory. Look again at the start of this prayer in chapter 17. After Jesus had said these things, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. The hour means the hour of his death. And Jesus says, this, the hour of my death, is going to be a moment of glory. Elsewhere, he talks about being lifted up, which sounds like he's going to be put high and honored. And it turns out he means being lifted up to die on a cross. And yet he still seems to associate that with honor. How does that work? Because there is great shame in being crucified. The process itself is deeply humiliating, stripped naked, tortured, and then left to die in great pain in public. And everything that crucifixion represented was humiliating. You are a criminal of the worst kind brought into line by the mighty Roman Empire. How can this be glory? Well, 
Remember that glory is the manifesting of God's words and God's works in the world. In this moment, as Jesus dies, God is doing the greatest thing for humanity that he will ever do. In this moment, he is paying the ransom price that his people, us, might be free. He is bearing God's wrath so that God can smile on us. Jesus is taking the curse that we might be blessed. Jesus is becoming sin so that sinners might become the righteousness of God. The cross looks horrific, but, and it is. But it is also the moment of God's greatest glory. Because in it he achieves the salvation of his people. The saving of the human race. The winning of many, many souls. In this moment, above all, we see Jesus fulfilling the will of the Father, doing what God has planned from a long ago, and thus indeed he is manifesting God's glory. It's here on the cross that we see, clearer than at any other time, that God loves us, that he would do anything to rescue us, that he is determined to defeat sin and the devil. And so indeed, Jesus is manifesting God's glory because here he shows the wonderful work of God, the most wonderful work that God will ever do. In this section, I'm asking, what is Jesus' glory? And the answer is that he set aside his own innate glory for a time, but instead his glory comes from making present the word and work of his Father. His glory is to live out God's will, and so have God's glory channeled through him. Sometimes through miracles, sometimes through suffering. That's Jesus' glory. That's the hard part. How does Jesus give glory to his people is my next question. If that's his glory, how does he pass it on? Well, if Jesus' glory is manifesting the word and works of God, then he passes it on by teaching his disciples to do the same thing. Every time he teaches them, the word of God, and they get it, and they're able to say it to someone else, then they too are displaying that bit of God's glory. Every time they do something that they learnt from Jesus, they're displaying God's glory, God's work. Now that seems like an audacious claim, right? To say that these ordinary people are doing the work of God and having the glory of God. That seems like an outrageous claim. Except that Jesus says that's exactly what he's going to do. Uh, And we can see that in John 14. After those famous words, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Philip says, show us the Father. And Jesus says this. And it sounds like a recap of all I've said so far, which is encouraging. It probably means we're on the right track. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, says Jesus. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus says, I speak God's words. I do God's work. So you've seen the Father. Then he says something amazing. Verse 12, you guys are going to have the same ability. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Let's break that down. Jesus says his disciples will be able to do great miracles, even greater ones than he did. How? They do that when they ask in Jesus' name, by calling on Jesus' authority and reputation. Why? so that the Father might be glorified in the Son. When the disciples do these amazing things, 
people will recognize that it's God's work done in Jesus' name on Jesus' behalf to Jesus' honor. That is, they will manifest the work of God. And that was our definition of what glory was, right? They will reveal God's glory. Jesus did God's work. That was his glory. The disciples are about to be doing God's work. So that same glory will rest on them. Jesus says the same things about his words in John 16, which we won't look at now, but same idea. When they speak his words, then they too reflect something of God's glory. All of this involves the Holy Spirit in important ways. We don't get to have God's glory all by ourselves. We need something of the presence and power of God within us. And John 14 and 16 and 17 have lots to say about that. We don't have time for it tonight, alas. Uh, But the point is this. Jesus shows God's glory by saying God's words and doing God's work. And then he hands that over to his disciples, to everyone who comes after them. So that they too, or we too, can show God's glory by doing God's works and saying his words. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? That the glory of God rests on us as we say God's words and do God's work. And that sounds exciting when we think about the miracles. Remember too, though, that God's glory was displayed in Jesus' suffering. And there too we might show God's glory. That is, in fact, exactly what Jesus told Peter at the end of John's Gospel when he predicted that Peter would die on Jesus, or, you know, for the name of Jesus. He says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. God. This is true for us then. We can manifest God's glory, yes, by our holy living, by participating in his work, by doing good things, perhaps even by miracles happening through us or in front of our eyes, but also by our suffering, by our endurance. By showing that we hold God's reputation as more important than our own ease. Or fitting in with the culture around us. Or whatever it is. We too can display the glory of God. In miracles, in suffering, in word and in work. What's the result of all that? We've said Jesus shows God's glory because he says and does what God says and does. And we've said that Jesus passes that ability on to us. We can say and do what God would have us say and do. What's the result of all this? Well, this results in unity. Unity with God. One of the big themes of John's gospel is the unity of the Father and Son. It comes out chapter after chapter after chapter. Over and over, Jesus says, I'm only doing what God tells me to do. I'm only saying the words that God has told me to give. For example, uh, John 14, again, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. That is, Jesus' unity with the Father is expressed because all he says is not his own words, but the Father's. All he does is not his own works, but the Father's. You say that, see that over and over again in John's Gospel. So if that's the, that's the way Jesus expresses unity with the Father, by saying God's words and doing God's works, and we then are saying God's words and doing God's works, then we too become united 
with the Father. We have the Father's glory, and so we are expressions of God's presence. God himself is with us through Jesus in the person of the Spirit, expressed in our transformed lives. That's the point of, um, you know, I am the vine, you are the branches, you've got to remain in me. And you read that passage, it's all about living in line with Jesus, doing what he tells us. Believing what he said, keeping his commands, letting my words remain in you. And when you do that, we'll be united. United with Jesus, united with the Father. And if we're united with God, then we're united with each other. If God is in us, in me, and you, and you, and you, and you, and we're in God, then here we are, one, together. And so we've reached the answer we were looking for. How does Jesus giving us glory mean we are united? Jesus' glory is to show the glory of the Father in the world, to do God's work. He can do that because he was sent from God and is united with God. Jesus passes on that glory to us. So we also are holders of God's glory united with him. And in being united with God, we're united with each other. As we speak God's words together, we are clearly united. United in what we say, in what we believe, in what we're on about. As we do God's works together, we're clearly united. We have the same purpose. We're doing the same things. Together. By enabling us to speak God's word and do God's work, Jesus has united us with him and with his Father and with each other. And the result will be that God's glory is shown in all the world. Just as people could glimpse God's glory by Jesus' authority, And his actions, so people will glimpse God's glory but by what we say and do. We ourselves have become demonstrations of God's glory because we are the saved ones of God. Because God's glory is shown most obviously, as I said, in the cross and then in the results of the cross, saved lives. That's when God's glory is greatest, isn't it? When he transforms a person, takes them from darkness to light. Think about it. Like, what is Spider-Man's greatest glory? When is he at his best? It's not when he's kind of just flying between buildings for the sake of it, doing his spidey thing. It's when he saves lives, right? Like, that's the high point of the movie, when he saves the day. So it is for God. His glory is shown in saving us. Not because it's us, but because we need saving. And then when on top of that, that's already a demonstration of God's glory, but then when we speak his words and do his work, then further and further we show his glory. And each time we do that, we confirm to the watching world that God sent Jesus. Because we keep on saying, it's Jesus who saved me, us. It's Jesus who taught us. It's Jesus who loves us. It's Jesus who's transforming us. It's Jesus who's empowering us to act in these new ways. It's exactly what Jesus said would happen all along, so that the world may believe that you, Father, have sent me. How does this all work out in practice? We're coming to an end. You might be thinking, that's all well and good. That was complicated, James. That's not what I signed up for on a 40-degree Sunday night. But what does it mean? How does it work out? I've got a few quick thoughts about Our unity. What does it mean that we who share in God's glory and it displays in us, what does that look like? Well, firstly, I think it should come out in our praise. In our singing, our praying, everything we do that declares what God has done for us. Every time we say what God has done, we're praising God honoring his work, that is, we're displaying his glory. For anyone 
who's listening or watching. And of course, we're united in doing that, right? Like we all sing Sunday after Sunday of how God has saved us, how he's worked, how he's taught us. With one voice, we glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why singing is such a good thing to do at church, because we all literally say the same things, or sing the same things together. Singing kind of expresses unity, because we can all say the same words in the same time, in the same way. Now, we, of course, might differ on how we like to do that, the style of song, how much we move around as we sing. Similarly, we might differ in the way we pray, but when we grasp what God has done, we're so excited to praise God that it doesn't really matter if it's not our favorite song today. Because we're much more excited about praising God than doing our favorite song while we do it. And we're willing to join in with anyone else who wants to praise Him. Because we love God that much. This thought came to me on the, on the way up. When we're on about the glory of God, then that unites us because we're not about our own glory. I'm not here to wave the flag for Salisbury Baptist. Yeah, the best Baptist church in the north. No, I'm, not here. I'm here on about God's glory, and I trust you are too. And that unites us, right? It stops us from being little tribal camps, and the, the, the Baptists are better than the Lutherans. Or the unitings, or the carrows around the corner. No, because we're on about the glory of God. And that will grow our unity because we're not on about our own little kingdom and our own little patch, our own way of doing things. Our unity will be on display when we work out God's mission together, when we're doing good in our community, when we're praying for others, when we submit our wills to God's will. Each of these things draw us closer to God and therefore into closer unity. All of this is to say that our unity is not something that turns us inward. There's a danger in doing an event around unity that we spend the whole night looking at each other. And making us turn inward and forget about the rest of the world. That's not what Jesus envisages as he prays that God would unite his people. He says, look up, look up to God, behold his glory, and speak his words and do his work and respond to him in praise, and doing that we'll be united rather than by looking at each other and just trying to copy each other. Get out there on mission. Do God's works. Invite others to join in too. So the more people come and join in this glorious unity. When the glory of God is the fountain of our unity, we will not become insular. We will not become inward looking and cut off and separate. We'll keep looking up to God. We'll keep looking out to others so that many might know that Jesus was sent of God and that we are his people together. Let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, God of glory, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he set aside his glory and yet continually showed your glory to the world. We thank you that through him we start to understand how truly wonderful you are. And then on top of that, he passed that glory along to us. He gave his disciples, who then gave others, your words and your work, enabling us to be your ambassadors, your messengers in the world. We too manifest your glory. What a privilege. Our God, as we do this, may we indeed be united with each other. May we be rowing in the same direction as we do your work on earth. May we sing in sweet harmony as we proclaim your words on earth. May each salvation that happens in our churches show that you are making one people, a demonstration of your glorious gospel that unites men and women, oldies and youngies, all nations, all backgrounds, into one people. 
people. May your glory be our driving force, our vision, our goal in all the world. And in so doing, may it draw us closer to each other and may our unity be further again to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' glorious name, now risen, ascended, and reigning with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.